but uh, we're going to go on uh, with the afternoon lesson here. We're looking at being uh, created in him for good works, and that is coming from Ephesians 2, where God has prepared for us things that he intends for us to accomplish, the reason for which we obey the gospel. And we're looking at the phrase, in season and out of season, which occurs in uh, Paul's letter to Timothy and is a reference, I think, to other ways of looking at time. And I wanted to look at Ecclesiastes 3 for with you for a minute about this, because uh, that's where we find this, uh, I guess this concept is introduced in the first place, that really, when you talk about a season, you're talking about the right time the right time for that to happen. Which is why it says in Ecclesiastes 3, and it's 1 through 8 that you're looking at here, <clears throat> famous lines, but he said, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. Which is to say there's just the perfect time for this or this other thing, something, whatever that thing is. If there's such a thing as just the perfect time for that to happen. And this is true for everything. For everything, there's a season, a time for every matter under heaven, meaning that there's always the right time for something, whatever that thing is. <laughs> uh, I'm told that corruption uh, and comedy, in corruption as in comedy, timing is everything. <laughs> I think that's true. But it's only half right. Timing is always everything. Um Everything is about the time for that to happen. And this happened at this time for this reason, which you can discern. Uh, the rest of these things, you know, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck, pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And these are the things that there's always a right time for this. That's just the right time for this thing to happen. This is what should be. That exists, first of all, and that's what you really mean by season, that there's always just the right time for this thing to happen, whatever this thing might be. But, you know, Ecclesiastes 11 also talks about time, and I guess in the perspective of the seasons and things that are happening uh, in life, when he says in the fourth verse, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. You know, the right time never comes if you're waiting for the perfect um, to come before you do the work of God, before you take an action. <laughs> uh, that's not the meaning of this. When we say there is a perfect time for, for everything, we're not saying you have to wait until conditions are perfect before you will do what God wants you to do or before you will accomplish something for God. That means the perfect thing will never come and you will never sow, you will never reap. Uh, it will never come to pass. That's not what we mean by the right time. Rather, you know, in Galatians chapter 6, uh, also by Paul, talking about seasons, um, there is this promise that uh, we in our work are not going to be overlooked by God. God isn't going to miss the fact that we are his and that we have worked on his behalf and we have done his will. Um, you know, there's going to be justice. If you have done the work of God, if you've lived the life of God, God sees that even if mankind does not see it, even if here maybe it's not appreciated or it's not recognized or even is punished, there will be real justice when God sees it. But it also says in the ninth and 10th verses, let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, 
let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. But we are to do good continually, knowing that there's coming a due season when we will reap, which may not be now. It may not be here on this earth. It might be at the reckoning at the last day in the judgment. But it is coming, and we do the right thing. It's always the time to do the right thing. But we do the right thing anticipating that there's coming a season when we reap, a time when God will give the judgment, and the judgment will be for us. This opportunity that he speaks of is our time, you know, here. We make that time. We, uh, you know, we don't uh, reap the corners of our vineyards. We don't go back after the gleanings, remember? Because we leave something extra for those who come afterward. Uh, We make those opportunities. We buy that time and take that to do good to everyone. So there's something there about the right time as well. These are all about, um, yeah, the right time for something to happen. It's not that you're waiting for the perfect before you can take action. It's that you're waiting or that you realize that things happen when they should be happening, that they are, the outcomes are the measuring stick. That's how you know what a thing is. So over at Second Timothy, when he talks about in season and out of season, he says um, in that place, it's verses two through six, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Well, the fact is that this passage in 2 Timothy is really about times. It's about times, it's about seasons. Our time in life, our, you know, our, if you will, our generation. But it's all about times. Everything that that Paul is saying here is predicated upon what we read in Ecclesiastes about the right time. The second verse, he said, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Uh, in season and out of season. So the first thing that we note is that it's always time to preach the word. (laughs) The word for getting ready is actually standing on. Preach the word, stand on the word, whether it's seasonable or whether it is unseasonable. So it's always time to preach the word, it's always time to stand on the word. There's not a time when it isn't the right time for that. No, the word of God is always right and always in season. (laughs) But there is a question being raised by him putting it this way, saying ready in season and ready out of season. It does raise a question, well, when would it be out of season? When would God's word be out of season? Is there a time when it, it's not the time for the word? Um, actually, he addresses that in verse 3. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. You know, this actually is worded as a statement, there is a time for people not to endure sound teaching. And that is a, a clear um, uh, allusion to Ecclesiastes 3 that we read, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. There is a time when people are not going to endure sound teaching, meaning there comes a point when this is what is going to happen. This is how it is. And Everything Paul is saying here is about times. 
So this time, the time for the word to be unseasonable is the time when the people will not endure the sound teaching. So uh, the thing that he says here is they will instead accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off after myths. So on the one hand, they turn away from the truth, uh, which is the thing that really ought to have our attention. On the other hand, they're turning to myths. Um, turning away from truth, but then myths, on, on the other hand, oh yeah, that I'll, I'll, I'll go for. You know, that's the idea. It's the opposite of what should be. But what he's getting at is there is a time for this. It happens this way. You get to this point. And when I think back in Ecclesiastes 3 about the things that it said for times, I think about this, that the people will not endure sound teaching, but will accumulate for themselves teachers after their own desires. What do you do about that? What do you do about that when they're teaching error, when they're teaching something that is just what the people want, not what the Bible says. Well, there is a time when that will happen, when the people no longer love the Lord, when the people no longer believe in truth. That's what will happen. They'll accumulate those teachers for themselves. Those are the ones that will get support. Those are the ones that will get meetings. That's how it goes. That's what the people do. But Ecclesiastes said there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. When the people bring forward a teacher after their own desire rather than after the soundness of the word of God, what should Timothy do about that? Should he embrace that or should he refrain from embracing? What time is it? Right? There's a time to seek and there's a time to lose. You know, there is. We want people to turn. And yet, doesn't there come a time when somebody really ought to know better? Somebody who is a teacher, has been teaching for decades, had, you know, his parents were Christians, his grandparents were Christians, Shouldn't he know better than to teach error? And how long do we need to study with that guy? How much time needs to be spent on him? Have your neighbors heard the truth yet? There's a time to seek and there's a time to lose. There's a time to keep and there's a time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. Should these be stitched together? Should we find a way of having fellowship with error? with false teachers, with brethren who do not believe in truth? Or should that be torn? All right, there is a time. What are we going to do? And that is really what it comes down to with Paul and, and Timothy. You know, this letter that he that Paul is writing to him, the second Timothy, that's the last one. That's the last thing that Paul ever wrote before Rome executed him. It's not clear that Timothy made it to Rome in time. Paul was asking him to hurry. It's not clear that Timothy made it in time. But he said, as for you, verse 5, you always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your service for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. This is about times, isn't it? The time for Timothy to stand on his own has come, right? That's what's happened. The time for Timothy to stand on his own is here. Paul's time draws to a close. He's written what he's going to write. He said what he's going to say. He's taught whom he's going to teach. And it's over. But Timothy, you know, 
He's not here anymore either. His time, his time came, and he had imparted these words to other men of faith who could impart these words to other men of faith. That's how we got here. <laughs> the word continually is making more Christians. The word continually is leading us in the way that we ought to go. These words are the things that provide for a church in every generation. I'm not claiming that we have a line of succession all the way back to Timothy. I'm saying the word that he's um, uh, entrusted with, the word that he's committed to, that is the thing that has always produced the teaching, the faithfulness, the church in every generation. The time for any generation comes to a close there's always going to be a time when it's it's up to me. I have to stand up. I have to take the place of those who passed on before me. You know, I used to be the kid who needed the help, who needed the you know the guidance, who leaned on the elders <laughs> and the older teachers, you know. Uh, and I noticed that nobody objected when I said I used to be a kid. By the way, I'm taking note of that. Uh, but <laughs> it's true. All of a sudden, I'm one of the older ones. And uh, mm -hmm. I seem to know a lot of things that some of the younger ones just, just it's never even occurred to them. How, how did this happen? <laughs> but it's true. Um, you, the time comes and you, you know, you're, you're going to teach. And I don't mean you wait till your old age before you do the right thing. I mean, there's an example of something just like what you're reading here. Paul's time came, and it's time for Timothy to stand on his own. And I'm sure he's thinking, I don't want to do this without Paul. But he has the word. He has the same word you and I have. He has the same Bible you and I have. That's what everybody has and what everybody needs. So it's Paul's leaving. It's up to Timothy. And what is Timothy going to do? Is it his own faith? Is it his own dedication? Or is he just doing this because his mother did this and his grandmother did this, as was recorded er earlier in the letter? Is he doing this because it's expected of him or because there's pressure on him? Or is he doing this because he loves God himself and he knows what is right and he chooses to do that? And it's true for all of us. We That time comes for every one of us. We have to decide that we love God, we serve God, these people are not here anymore. The Bible is. And in the end, I would come back to Acts 24, at verse 25, where Paul, in captivity, reasons with his captors, not that he should be set free, but that they should become Christians. <laughs> I always thought that was interesting. He's a Roman citizen, completely unjustly imprisoned, but he's not spending his time saying he shouldn't be in prison and they should let him go. He's spending his time teaching about Jesus. And it says in Acts 24, verse 25, that Paul reasoned with Felix about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. As he did so, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I'll summon you. Yeah, at, at, at this, he says, uh, you know, uh, for now, go away. When it's the right time, I'll bring you back. That's what that says. When it's the right time, this is when I get an opportunity. No, 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 when it's the right time. When is it going to be the right time to obey God? What are we waiting for? You know, it's like the word. There's never a, a wrong time for the word. <laughs> and there's never a wrong time to do what is right, to obey God. Today is the day of salvation. Felix put this off, and you know what? It never comes. The right time never comes. Uh, as we read in Ecclesiastes 11, uh, verse 4, he who regards the wind will never sow. He who regards the clouds will never reap. The right time is never going to come. The perfect time is never going to exist. The devil won't let that happen. Felix never called Paul back. It 
Today, are you a Christian? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? It's time to obey the gospel of Jesus. If you have not done so, we have water prepared for you to obey the gospel, to help you with that which God has called you to. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Let us pray with you, pray for you based on your repentance, that you might be restored to the service of God, to the dedication to God. Times and seasons, you know, are up to us. When is it my time? When is it my responsibility? When is it my own thing? Well, the truth is that already happened. It's been like that for a while. And perhaps we've overslept. It's time to wake up. If today you're not a Christian, obey Jesus Christ in baptism for forgiveness of sins. If today you're a Christian and need our prayers, let us help you. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, let your need in the Lord be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.